How you doing, pup? This is a 1971 Triumph Spitfire. I'll give you one guess why it's here. And no, it's not an electrical problem. At least not yet. There's some trick for opening the hood. Sorry, the bonnet. But I can't remember what it is. So we're gonna try this. Nope, that didn't work. Perfect. Max is not impressed. I think this is the smallest car I've ever had on my lift. So if you haven't figured it out, it's got a big oil leak. Like a big oil leak. And supposedly it's the oil pan gasket or bolts are missing. Or maybe the timing cover. Uh, I'm not so sure. Usually that only leaks when they're running. And this thing leaks all the time. So I'm betting we're gonna find a hole in something. Okay, we're going under. Keep in mind, this is a 52 year old British car from Illinois. So let's not be too shocked by what we find on the bottom side. I can tell you that the body is mostly Bondo. I think it's okay, these things came from the factory as death traps. A Little bit of rust isn't gonna make it a whole lot worse. So we got a pretty good silicone job here on the timing cover and the oil pan. But the big problem is, I think the drain plug is just leaking. So we should be able to fix that. It's been dripping pretty good. Looks like she's got a strong case of structural floor mats on both sides. That one might have some fiberglass in it. So these have pseudo independent rear suspension. It's kind of like a Volkswagen. I think they call it swing arm suspension. So these are are sort of prone to rolling over. It's like the brake line is leaking pretty bad. I don't know if you just didn't get that tight or what's going on. Anyway, yeah, the exhaust is a little low too. We're gonna have to take a look at that. Let's get the oil dropped out of it and see if we can plug up some big leaks. Well, there's your problem. It's not even close to tight. I wonder if it's stripped out. Nah, it tightens up pretty good. All right, well, get it out of there. Appears to be a tapered pipe thread. This is my experience with working on British stuff. It might have been built in the 1970s, but it was designed in the 1870s. Careful, don't fall off there. Mom will be upset. This is inch and 13 sixteenths, which I have, but not enough room 
behind the radiator to get a socket. So we're gonna try something here. We'll just see how tight it is. Let's do the old trick here and wedge something onto the connecting rod. I gotta say, this is the drippinest engine I've ever seen. The oil pump just continuously drips. It's been 24 hours, it shows no signs of stopping. And we'll find out in a minute, but I suspect what's happened is this front main bearing cap here is aluminum. Sorry, aluminium. And of course, it's British, so all the bolts are fine thread, and they have stripped out, would be my guess. So we're probably going to have to find some 5 16 fine thread helicoils. Too much silicone. There must have been some kind of law in England that all engines had to be built with only fine thread hardware. Now technically speaking, fine thread fasteners are stronger and they're better in high vibration environments. You'll see them in like aircraft applications. But in aluminum, it's not the greatest idea. Yeah, I wonder what that does. Who knows? Alternator mounting bolt. You guessed it. Fine thread. With a lock nut. Can't get to it with power tools. Come on, Wes. Stiff upper lip. It's just a car. Okay, that appears to be an alternator, so I'm guessing this is no longer positive ground. But I don't really know. I would prefer to stay completely out of the electrical system if possible. But we're going to find out that you can't get this off without pulling the water pump. Come on, Wes. Now, I believe there's some kind of a timing chain tensioner inside the cover. Gonna so have to watch for that. I think from the massive amount of our TV, we can deduce that something is wrong with this bottom bolt. I mean, I like silicone as much as the next guy, but... This is a little excessive. Well, there's your problem. Threads are stripped. So for some reason there's a little block of aluminum here underneath of the main bearing. Looks like the ones in the bottom are okay. For now anyway, there's a, a plate in the back as well. So we just need to heel coil that one hole. I had to order a 5 16 24 heel coil kit. Got every other weird size, but I did not have that one. M8, M6, M5, 3 8 24, quarter 28, half 20, what is this, 5 8 18, but I still didn't have the right one. 
can't fit a regular drill, but I think I can fit this right angle job. Let's see if we can get lined up. It is a blind hole, so I don't want to go too crazy and blow through the end of it. Pretty close. This is the steering rack. I don't really want to remove that, so it'll screw up the alignment. Fingers just don't work well enough to do this today. There. It's in, we just had to break off the little tab. Which is sometimes tricky. Okay, we can start putting it back together. I think we're gonna treat this gasket with some Permatex number three. Should be a little more digestible. If it oozes out into the engine than the red, you know, the red RTV. Ideally, we could put it on dry, but this is not an ideal situation. This covers kind of bent and deformed and it's 50 years old so we're gonna give ourselves a little help the bolt holes are pretty stretched out on both so we'll just give them a gentle massage The bolt holes are flat-ish. The gasket is prepped, got all new hardware. The trick is gonna be this timing chain tensioner. I'm gonna have to do kind of a reach around move and, and tuck that in from the back side. Not sure how that's gonna go. That's it. You guys can't see it, but that's a straight slot pan head screw, and those go wherever the outer timing cover bolts only to the inner timing cover, not to the engine block. Don't ask me why they did that, but that's how it's supposed to be. I don't have a torque spec, so it's gonna be whatever I feel like. I'm guessing it shouldn't be a whole lot, maybe 
10, 12 foot pounds, something like that. There is a key in the crankshaft. I put a little oil on the, the seal surface. Like so. And I put a little bit of RTV on the face just so it doesn't try to leak around the nut. Well, let's see. Is that gonna work? I guess it could still leak around the threads, but we'll give ourselves a fighting chance. I'll install my crankshaft jammer. And we'll go ahead and torque that to factory spec. Okay, I'm going to put a little bit of RTV at the seam here. And there's two in the back also. I guess we better do something with this exhaust. So we're missing a nut here. But it looks like the whole thing is kind of turned, like maybe a lot. Yeah. More like that. I think we are done on the bottom side. Our brake line does not appear to be leaking. Should probably tie that up, but otherwise I think we're fine. The exhaust is, well it's not dragging the ground. It is contacting the, the frame here and here, but I think it's the best I can do. Oil pans reinstalled. I did put some Teflon tape on the drain plug, so hopefully that won't leak. Put the belt back on, put a little oil in it, and we should be done. Got ourselves a new Fram. I think the oil filter's got more displacement than the engine. The owner runs 20W50. I would assume that not only does it leak oil, but it also burns quite a bit. I don't think this tensioner bracket's supposed to be just jammed up against the thermostat housing, but that's how it was, so that's how it's going to be. I think we're ready for a rip. I like this fan arrangement. So it's got this electric fan that's spaced way out from the radiator, and then this plastic fan on the water pump, but no shroud. This little thing right here is the whole shroud. I guess. 35 horsepower engine doesn't need a whole lot of cooling. All right, let's crack on. Well, I found the problem. This is a 5 thousandths feeler gauge. So that's not gonna work. Not sure what to do about it. We can try to straighten it again, I guess, but I feel like we're probably gonna ruin that gasket when we pull the pan back down. Might be time for some, some silicone. 
I don't know, I think that inner timing cover gasket is leaking too. I don't know, we'll figure it out. Here's the problem. That's a 20 thousandths feeler gauge, half a millimeter, with room to spare. So that's not gonna work. I flattened the bolt holes, but I neglected to flatten the entire oil pan. So we're gonna have to rig something up to beat that back into shape. all it takes. So probably what happened is somebody jammed something under there to pry the, the oil pan off and they just bent the flange. I just didn't catch it. It's bent along the sides too. It's better. I don't know how flat it really needs to be. So it's much better, but it's still not perfect. So that's a 5 thousandths feeler gauge. What would that be? 0.25 millimeter? Is that good enough or not? I don't know. I actually have another oil pan gasket, but I don't think we're gonna use it. We're gonna go Japanese style and just use some RTV. This is Permatex Ultra Gray. Seems to do a pretty good job. I don't know. If anybody out there watching is, a, is an engineer in the gasket making world, I would love to talk to you about the various theories. I mean, I've seen companies like Toyota, they don't seem to really use gaskets anywhere. Everything is RTV. Then you have domestic companies like Ford that kind of go back and forth. In some cases where they have stamped steel pans or valve covers that bolt up to aluminum heads or blocks, the gasket seems to work better than RTV, something to do with the thermal expansion. Seems like RTV works pretty well, but you have to be careful with it. You don't want to put on too much. You don't want to put on too little and everything has to be absolutely clean. Okay, we're just gonna snug these up and we'll let the RTV dry for four hours before we torque them up. About 24 hours have passed. I did torque the bolts after four hours. It looks good. You can see the RTV just squeezing out here, but we don't have big gobs of it dripping all over. So it should be roughly the same on the inside. We've given it plenty of time to set up, so we shouldn't have any problems with it, you know, separating and clogging up the oil pickup or anything like that. All right, we'll refill the oil and we'll try it again.
Interesting driving experience. This is my view. The eye line is right at the top of the windshield. It says we're out of gas, I mean petrol, and we're already overheated. It has a switch. That's the entire electronics. These are heat controls, I guess. Don't know what they do. It's a four speed maybe or a three speed. Not really sure. Got to push the knob in to go to reverse like a Volkswagen. No power steering, no power brakes, no radio. Does have seat belts. Anyway, here we go. Is there a fourth gear? Yes. <laughs> Wish I could see Right, the rear end's pretty loud. Turn signals work. Doesn't have self canceling turn signals. It's like driving a semi. Got no foot room. Barely any knee room. This car was not made for a guy my size. That's for sure. I'm gonna lose my hat. I can see why he likes it. The idle speed's way too high. fun. It rides pretty good too. The brake pedal and the gas pedal are a little too close together. In case you're wondering, it's about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, 10 degrees Celsius. I love the key switch. Okay, we survived. It's like a quirky British motorcycle with four wheels. It's pretty fun. For the moment, it's not leaking. So I'm gonna send it down the road. I've worked on a lot of British engines and tractors and machine tools, but I think this is my first British car, at least my first vintage British car. And don't tell anybody I said this, but it's kind of fun to work on. I mean, it's so simple. It's just, it's refreshing compared to the over-engineered crap that they're building today. Yeah, thanks for watching. Son of a bitch.
modern farming is almost unbelievable. When I was a kid, my grandpa, he farmed 140 acres. It would take him two months to harvest all of his crops. These guys can do 140 acres in about six hours. And even more crazy, you know, back then 180 bushels an acre was a good crop. These guys are upset if they get less than 250. Of course, the flip side is that machine probably costs $750,000. With the tractor, the grain cart, and the semi, there's easily a million dollars in the field.